leverage your relational capital with people who are unchurched or have not been in the church in a while to see if we can fill the house and see if God will honor our faith. So the Bible says when he saw their faith, it was their faith that activated the compassion of Jesus. It was their faith that moved the heart of Jesus. It was their faith that caused Jesus to give his attention to this man's situation. It was their faith. And sometimes we underestimate the power of our faith to get the attention of God and to activate the hand of God and to move the heart of God. So the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, then he looked at the man, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now on the surface, that appears that Jesus missed the whole point. But maybe there's something beneath the surface that we have not fully understood. You see, in the Jewish context, there are many Jews that believe that all sin, I mean all sickness and all suffering was a direct result of personal sin. And so if somebody was sick or someone was suffering, they concluded that they were suffering because of God's judgment or because of God's punishment. And that may be the problem here. It may very well have been this man was in this situation as a re direct result of his own personal sin that his friends knew about. And that his friends were bringing him to Jesus, hoping that maybe his sins could be forgiven. Because there is no objection on their part when Jesus makes this statement, your sins are forgiven you, there's nothing in the text that says the man was upset, nor does anything that says that his friends were upset. They don't object. Wait a minute, we didn't bring him here for that. There's no objection to Jesus' decree that the man was a sinner and that the man needed his sins to be forgiven. The objection came from the religious elite. And so their response to Jesus' declaration of this man's pardon, that his sins were forgiven. Verse 6, but some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoned in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now their theology was partially right. Nobody can forgive sins but God only. Amen. Only God can forgive sins. So they were partially right that only God can forgive sin, what they did not understand, nor were they willing to accept, that Jesus himself was God in the flesh with the authority to forgive sin. Amen. As we've talked in weeks past, people need forgiveness. And people can't be forgiven until they recognize that they're guilty. They recognize that they really need to be forgiven. As I was thinking, as I was driving in this morning, and I was kind of meditating on this text, there's something about unforgiveness that can really spoil and can contaminate our entire system. We can be bitter and cantankerous and mean and resentful and hateful toward people when there is unforgiveness in our heart. We've all been wounded, as I share with you before. We've all been scarred. We have all been stabbed in the back. We've all been sucker punched. And until we understand and come to grips with the depth of our pain and how that pain injured us and how it has influenced us and caused us to see people and look at people and respond to people, we can never be delivered. Because very often we will be operating from our point of pain, and that's how we'll respond to people. Amen. I was with my good friend, Glenn Walker. Glenn Walker is an absolute genius. Amen. An absolute genius. And his genius comes from his humility. He always underestimates himself. He always underestimates the power and the influence that he has. I'm going to pin this article on the board next week. There was an article in the New Haven paper where Glenn Walker is on the front page 
of the New Haven paper because of work that he's doing, going inside the Manson Correctional Institution in Connecticut, working with young men who are incarcerated in a fatherhood initiative program. And they were going to shut the program down. And the people came down from the big headquarters in the Hartford to shut the program down. But the boss lady said, why don't y'all go up and see what he's doing? So the people from the Department of Health and Human Resources from Connecticut came to Hartford, Connecticut. Glenn is there with 25 or so young men around the table performing his magic. And these people cannot believe how he's getting these young boys to open up and talk about their situation and circumstances that led to their incarceration. Glenn scours New Haven and Hartford and Bridgeport, going into the toughest neighborhoods to get these boys' girlfriends and their babies and bring them to the prison so these young men can bond with their children. And so that they maybe will be motivated to take advantage of the educational opportunities when they realize they have a reason to prepare themselves for relief. It's utterly amazing. And so I go with him on Thursday nights. On Tuesdays and Thursday nights, he facilitates a domestic violence workshop. Glenn ain't taking no course in no domestic violence. What do you know about some domestic violence? They got 25 out of heart. He calls them New Haven's finest. I mean a cast of characters that they assemble together there in New Haven for this domestic violence workshop. But they got this PhD lady because she is credentialed with all the training, the certificates, the degrees, been to the classes, got the hats, the mugs, the t-shirts, and everything. And so she, she comes into the room, and I'm trying to, you know, Brother Glenn talks uh, just in very uh, high, flattery terms about you, and he thinks the world of your skill and so forth. And the woman looked at me and said, look, this Glenn's group. <laughs> she said, I'm just in there. <laughs> These men not listening to me. They ain't got, they ain't got, they were nothing I got to say. This is Glenn's group. <laughs> and so I go in, and I sit in this group and watch Walker dealing and working and maneuvering and getting these guys to open up and talk. These guys are drunks and drug addicts and they've been all over the place, but they are sentenced for 52 weeks they gotta listen to Walker. 52 weeks, two days a week, 104 sessions, they gotta come and listen to him. He just quoting the Bible, he talking about the, I said, Glenn, you can't do that. Why come I can't do it? That's all I know. And I'm watching the power of God unleashed and he doesn't even realize that God has already given him the favor and the stature with these men. And so I'm going to take all of these Sunday school books that we've been uh, ordering too many, I'm boxing them all up, and I'm sending them to Glenn. And I said, look, start a Sunday school class. They will come if you invite them to come. They ain't going to nobody's church. They don't feel right in the church, don't feel like they fit in the church. But because of his spiritual genius and how God has used him, to get these men to open up and how they now are knitted and bonded to him. They be talking crazy. And Glenn say, hey, wait, hold it, hold it, hold it. Grown men, grown men, calm down. And then listen to every word that falls from his mouth. And so they said, all right, this is Glenn had told them about me. And I was coming to visit. This is your boy. This is your boy. What he got to say? We want to hear what he got to say. We want to hear what the Virginia guy got to say. I didn't really have nothing to say. I just kind of was in the room. But here's what God put on my heart to say. It's what I just told you. They were trying to teach them this principle of empathy. And the men didn't know what the word meant. Sympathy means you feel sorry for somebody. But empathy means that you feel what they feel. You feel the pain that they feel. You feel the hurt that they feel. And that's what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says is that we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity in Ephesians, uh, Hebrew 4. Jesus Christ is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He feels our pain. He feels our agony. He feels our grief. It is beautifully demonstrated in John chapter 11, right about verse 25, after Lazarus had died and had been dead for four days, and the Bible says that Jesus came and he bowed at the tomb of dead Lazarus, who was inside of the tomb, had been there for four days, and the Bible says that he wept so bitterly and so profusely and so heavily that even the religious leader says, oh, how he loved him. So he enters into the grief of Mary and Martha. He feels their pain, their agony, their trauma at that moment. That's what empathy is. The church is supposed to be an empathetic place, not a place of condemnation. 
not a place of judgment and of self-righteousness. Not tell stories about myself because I run into myself in the thoroughfare of life where my Christianity is really tested. Really tested. You know, we're trying to buy these abandoned houses in the neighborhood because we got a big vision. And it may be my grandest failure. 